Hey, Bill. Hey, how are you? Be good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. We are, uh, we really want to hear about this. This is, this is, an, um, so for everyone, um, I'm not sure if you've been here last week, uh, but we made the announcement last week. So uh, there was a study on uh, Firefox users and what uh, kind of archetypes uh, we have as users. Um, and because it's Shimmer, we are also designing for those archetypes. I uh, thought it would be great to hear about the results of that study, and what kind of users we actually have, and what kind of users we should be um, focusing on, and designing for. So I'm I'm really excited to hear about this. Um, Bill, um, feel free to. Oh, so I I don't know if you guys had other, uh, other topics that you were going to discuss, or is this specifically for? Yeah, I just wanted. You know, let me jump in real quick. So just uh, so people know, um, there is an Etherpad for this meeting. I put it in the Pound Sumo channel. There was one action item from last week. It's done, um, and there's some status updates that you can read. It's um, about our information architecture, which is a project in process, but there's nothing really to look at right now. Um, so there's there's that. So I just wanted to mention that that's all there, but I guess there's nothing really to talk about. And the rest of the time uh, is yours. Great. Uh, so let me, I'm giving you guys sort of the shorter version of this presentation so that we'll actually have some time to um, to chat a little bit, answer some questions. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go so much into methodology. Um, let me hold on. Well, if you could send me a link to the, the etherpad, like I'd be happy to answer questions. That way too. But, sure. um, I'm actually, I turned off IRC so that I can, uh, <laughs> uh, keep track of all of my, uh, um, let me send you an email. Obviously. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Can you guys see that? Yes. Should say Firefox desktop user types in North America. So Michael actually participated in uh, some of this research. Like he went along uh, on one of the segments for this. Um, so I'm Bill Selman. I'm a senior user experience researcher uh, in the UX department. Uh, and we started this project in September of last year. Uh, and it was sort of drawn out over a long period of time. Um, but uh, this was a project to essentially understand uh, who are our users like in a behavioral sense. like. How can we break down the different types of users that we have using Firefox desktop primarily um, based on their a sort of set of, of attributes? Um, so, <clears throat> hold on. There we go. Whoops. This is, hmm. hold on. There we go. Can you guys see that a little bit better? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, the first, you know, the, the first thing that we, we wanted to do with this project, we, we knew that Firefox has been around for a long time now. And from what we know, based on the history of uh, the research that's been done, there's never really been a systematic user typology or behavioral segmentation of Firefox user types. We have various pieces of information from different departments about different kinds of studies and users, but there's never been a sort of systematic uh, approach to understanding uh, the different types of users. Uh, and you know, for a product that's as mature as Firefox is, it's really essential from a, from so many different perspectives: from product, from Sumo, from uh, engineering, from just every everybody needs to know like this information. It's really important uh, in order to, to continue to be a successful product. Um, so the, the reason, I mean, it's pretty self-evident, but the reason to have um, this kind of information is 
that it allows us to understand who our users are and what their needs are. It allows us to understand who specifically we're designing features for. It allows us to know approximately what size of our user base belongs to a specific set of grouped um, attributes. Um, it allows us to prioritize features and to design for specific types of users, those features. Um, it also, the qualitative work, uh, which Michael participated in, gives us insights into our current um, features and challenges that users might be having with them, but it also gives us insights into new features that we could be developing. And also gives us some idea about how salient the features that we're currently thinking about develop, developing are for different kinds of users. Uh, and it finally uh, allows us to uh, make a, a pretty reasonable assessment of which types of users uh, will adopt or reject specific kinds of features. Um, so when we're talking about user types and, and developing a user typology study, uh, how do we differentiate different types of users? What kinds of data? Um, and so for our purposes, uh, we were co collecting four different kinds of information about users. So the first and most important for us was behaviors. So what kinds of people are actually, or what, what are people actually doing when they use Firefox? Um, second are what are users' beliefs? What do they believe that influences what they're doing when they're using Firefox? And those beliefs could be about lots of different things, for example. It could be about themselves and how they feel like their relationship to technology is or how good or expert they are at technology. It could be about technology itself. Those beliefs could be about Mozilla or Firefox or about our competitors. Um, the, the third thing that we want to understand is, is what are users' motivations? Why are users doing what they do? Is it based on beliefs and other factors such as time or economic constraints? Um, motivation is, is, is an interesting crossroads of, of belief and behavior. And finally, um, we want to understand what users' attitudes are. And this is, to us, um, important and interesting, but probably less so than the other factors. By attitude, what we mean by this is what do users enjoy or dislike about what they're doing? Uh, and how does that inform the other factors? This is sort of the more, um, yes, I like this, no, I don't like this, preferences kinds of, of, of uh, attributes. Um, but to us, that is sort of like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and really, uh, is, is, we were really more interested in, in the other three factors more primarily um, in order to build these sort of user types. So, I'm going to just go through a brief overview of what we did. Uh, there's actually, like, if, if people are interested, I, you know, at some other point, I'm happy to go into methodology uh, in a lot more detail um, because there's a lot of uh, interconnected parts with this project. Uh, but the three, my, the, the, the way just we decided to approach this project was through three interconnected components. Uh, the first was a series of in-home qualitative interviews uh, with participants in various locations over throughout North America. And again, I want to qualify uh, this, this talk by saying that these are user types for North America. Uh, that's not to say that they aren't possibly relevant uh, in other regions in the world, but I would not make that assumption. Uh, I would assume that there are probably different user types or more likely is that there's probably some similar user types, but the population percentages are going to be really different in different parts of the world. Um, so we don't know that, and I would uh, argue that if we wanted to make those assumptions, then we should do that this work in, in those other regions as well in order to, to uh, have a higher degree of certainty. Uh, so... Um, we did these contextual in-home interviews. Um, we did them in three major locations in the U.S. and Canada. We did them in, in and around Toronto, uh, in and around uh, L.A. and Southern California, and in and around uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we recruited, for all of these parts of the, the project, we recruited participants who identified um, 
as that Firefox was the browser that they use more than 50% of the time. So we were really interested in users who use multiple browsers, um, but we were interested in users who identified Firefox as their primary browser. Uh, for the qualitative parts, so those are the first two segments that we did, the in-home qualitative interviews, uh, and then a diary study uh, that was an online five-day diary study that we conducted via Qualboard, which asked people to share information um, two times per day to get a more uh, <clears throat> longitudinal, short-term longitudinal notion uh, of how people were using Firefox, their behaviors, motivations, uh, et cetera, over a, a, a set period of time as opposed to uh, a short window when we were in people's homes. Um, and so uh, for the demographics for all of these, these were all census balanced uh, demographics for the most part, particularly when we got to the quantitative survey, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but uh, which is interesting because that's not to indicate that um, we, that, that a census balance representation is necessarily like who Firefox users are. Um, but we know that uh, metrics is actually in the process of compiling a survey uh, to, to gather that information about who demographically our users are. And they're actually going to be using um, some of the questions from our quantitative survey uh, to help uh, to answer some of those questions and also to further the, this, this study. So we'll actually be able to do some revisions based on the, to the, to the population percentages that we get based on uh, that metric survey, which should be done this summer. Um, so then, so we did all this analysis. We identified initially five different user types based on our qualitative research. So then what we did was identify the salient attributes of each of the user types um, and then put together a quantitative survey with a thousand participants uh, that we ran uh, to determine A, are these valid attributes and valid user types? And B, uh, once we know the validity of those yes or no, uh, what are the population percentages for each of those uh, user types that we identified? So we actually found from the um, uh, quantitative validation there were actually six user types. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because we sort of, when we were doing the quantitative and qualitative analysis and we're putting together the initial types, we thought, well, we sort of felt like there was this other group beyond the fifth, beyond the five groups that we initially identified. Um, but we were sort of reluctant to, we wanted to have five user types just because we felt like that would be uh, and the easiest way to digest this information. But we found that there was actually six really important groups. Um, and in terms of, excuse me, in terms of the factors and that were really salient that we identified uh, for the different user types based on their behaviors, et cetera, uh, we learned that first, the, 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 these factors were the, the distinguishing factors to identify specific user groups. So the first is an enthusiasm for technology and the internet. The second is change aversion. Uh, the third is anxiety about technology. Uh, the fourth is self-confidence with technology. The fifth is a utility-oriented view of technology. Uh, and when we go in and talk about the Busy Bee group that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, that's I'll go into more uh, information and detail about what utility-oriented view means. Uh, and finally, uh, users who are focused on software development and um, uh, web development. So here are the user types that we identified. Uh, there are six groups, as I said, and I'll go through each of these groups. Uh, I'm going to go through them in order of the largest populations uh, for each, like which group is the largest to which group is the smallest uh, in terms of an overall population percentage. So the first, the first group are the enthusiasts. The second group are busy bees, the third are middle managers, the fourth are stalwarts, the fifth are evergreens, and the sixth are wizards. 
So I'm going to walk through each of the user types and go into more detail um, about uh, about each of them. So I'm happy to take a que some questions about methodology right now, if you have any. Uh, but if they're about like specific types and things like that, yeah. then um, let's hold those to the end because I, they might be answered. Just a question. Uh, so one request: if if you're not talking or anyone else, could you please mute, mute yourself? There's someone breathing right now, and I it's really weird to hear that all the time. Thank you. Uh, nope. My qu my question would be: uh, Was the goal of this to get uh, categories that are mutually exclusive but collectively exhaustive, or are they overlapping? And that's a good question. So yeah, I would say that. Um, all of the attributes, the factors that we identified as primarily salient um, are overlapping among groups. So it is more like a continuum. It's more like a, a set of, um, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm thinking of? It's more like um, modes in a way. Uh, so people sort of fall into uh, each of these groups uh, strongly or weakly. Um, and people fall into each of these groups um, in, in terms of the overall population, we Excuse found me. that. Uh, I, I, sorry, I'm, I didn't express that correctly. What I meant was the user types themselves, not, not the people who fall into those types, but the user types themselves. Are they supposed to be uh, mutually exclusive, like for example, uh, you can be a software developer and you can be risk averse. No, no, they are not. So people, there are, and actually, we'll get to that in a minute. There are actually hybrid groups. Um, there are people who fall into uh, a group. Uh, it's more than one group. Okay. So essentially, like clusters of behaviors, motivations, beliefs. Um, and there are certain people that will fall very strongly into one of these groups. There are people who will fall more weakly into one of these groups. And then there are um, people who sort of fall between the groups or belong to more than one group. So it's, it's definitely, it's more like a spectrum. Hints are uh, these having different colors. OK. Great. So the first group, well, he, so here's the population percentages uh, for each of these groups. Uh, and you'll see this information as well. But it was interesting because about 91% of people fell either strongly or mediumly strongly into one of these clusters. Uh, and then about 9% of the population was a hybrid of, um, of these of, of these groups. So they didn't fit strongly into one group, but they felt, or they, they fell uh, sort of weakly between two groups, which was a pretty interesting result. Um, all right, so the first group are the enthusiasts. Uh, and we have characters for each one of these uh, that uh, Jensho made, uh, which I, I really love. Uh, I think these are great. Um, and uh, we have I, so there's an I statement for each one of the groups that we that we created. So the first group of enthusiasts, the I statement is I enthusiastically learn about and adopt new technology. I enjoy solving my own technology problems. Um, so uh, this is a participant that we interviewed in Toronto uh, who is an enthusiast. Uh, I'm not going to read all the quotes. Uh, I will actually share this version of the presentation with everyone so that you can go into this in more detail. Um, you don't want to listen to me read slides for 45 minutes. It's not very exciting. Uh, but you're happy to, you're, I'm happy to share it with you, and you, you're welcome to go through this on your, your own time. Um, so the enthusiasts are uh, about 30% of the population. Uh, they tend to skew younger and male. Uh, they are enthusiastic about new technology. Uh, they solve their own technology problems. Uh, they're, they want to feel in control of their browsing experience. Uh, they're likely to have customizations in the browser, so they're likely to use add-ons of some kind. Excuse me, having some hiccups this morning. Uh, they're self-confident with new technology. Uh, 
uh, and they're more likely to use uh, streaming media and have their data synced among multiple devices. Uh, interestingly, this group uh, has a um, higher level of educational attainment than many other groups, uh, and they are online the vast majority of the time, or they, they self-report that they are online often or, quote, all the time. Um, in terms of, so this was slides that I created more for the product group, although I certainly think that it's relevant to um, Sumo. Uh, and so um, I'm just going to go through a couple of these. In terms of uh, the things that we can do for these particular groups, in terms of features that we're in the process of discovering or talking about, um, you know, innovation on the web, like this is a group that's really hungry for new features uh, and sort of the latest and greatest and want, uh, you know, as much integration among all of their different technology services as possible. So for that reason, like it's really important for us to work on things like sync and save for later, uh, WebRTC, uh, multi-search. Um, also, this is a group that has a much more sophisticated notion of privacy and security uh, and is a lot more privacy and security conscious than some of the other groups. Um, and so from a UX perspective, those people having easier access to privacy and security controls uh, is are certainly relevant features for them. Um, it's interesting, like when it's, I'll talk a little bit about privacy and security um, when talking about some of the groups that have less sophisticated mental models of that, um, of those notions. Um, I think it's pretty interesting uh, and certainly offers a lot um, of points for future discussion about how we can support those users. Um, so the second group are busy bees. Uh, busy bees, uh, their I statement is, I lead a busy life and I expect hot technology just to work. I'm not interested in the technical details behind how the technology in my life works. Um, so this was a woman that we interviewed in North Carolina. Uh, where, did, Michael, did you uh, interview this woman? Okay, I don't know if you were there that day. Um, she was a uh, pretty interesting character. Um, I was not on that interview, but um, I don't think that's actually a quote from her. Um, but anyway, uh, so busy bees. Uh, busy bees have a utility-oriented view of technology. So when I was talking about that attribute earlier, so for them, the internet is like an appliance. It's not something they're interested in. Um, it's something that they use to do things on. They're not interested in uh, how it works or um, why things are set up in a particular way. They just expect it to deliver the content to them or help them in complete a transaction, say for banking or buying travel tickets, uh, et cetera. Like they don't want to have to deal with infrastructure or any kind of challenge to it. They don't want to have to know the mental model of the internet in order to accomplish what they're doing. Um, and so in that way, like in the, in the sense that you just don't, you know, when you use your microwave, for example, if you have a microwave or your washing machine, you don't necessarily uh, care about uh, how the spin cycle works and, you know, the different stages of, of washing clothes and how all the machinery and engineering behind that works in order to fix it or to, to keep it operational. This group has the same orientation toward uh, how the internet works. Uh, this is a group that's really busy with other things in their life, like they tend to have families, uh, and so they don't necessarily prioritize time spent online for its own sake. Unlike the enthusiasts who were sort of live on the internet and it's really important to them, uh, this is a group that the internet is where you go to do things. Uh, it could be to watch a movie, it could be to uh, deposit money in your checking account, uh, it could be to find out a bus schedule, but uh, it's not to necessarily browse Reddit or, uh, you know, engage in internet life and activity. Uh, as I said earlier, this is, they're not interested in the details behind technology. Uh, they're somewhat impatient uh, with technological difficulties. 
Uh, so they don't want to be troubleshooting. They don't want to have to solve those problems for themselves. Uh, and finally, uh, this is a group that has some data, data integration across devices. So they will likely have uh, a smartphone or uh, a tablet, and they'll probably have their email set up. But they're not going to be running something like Dropbox, for example. They're not going to have, uh, you know, all of their uh, personal documents, et cetera, synced across multiple devices and be able to access that everywhere. Uh, this is a group that skews a bit older and is, is more female. So in terms of things that we can do for them, uh, browser stability is really important. Um, speed and efficiency of the browser. So I wouldn't expect them to optimize or even want to even bother with that. Uh, simplified and integrated help and support. Uh, so this is a group that was pretty interesting. Like we interviewed some of the, some people in this group and they were, they found the help part uh, is something that they actually used, um, but found it kind of frustrating in some ways. So for example, they would go to the help section. I interviewed this one woman in Toronto uh, who was telling me about the last time that she had a, a problem uh, with Firefox that she didn't understand. Uh, and so she went to the troubleshooting information section under help. And it was not what she expected. Um, so it's really interesting. Like, I think we should, and I know that you guys are working on different, the information architecture uh, for different parts of support. And I think it would be really interesting to explore the vocabulary that this group and the group of evergreens that I'll talk about in a few minutes uses to describe what they're doing when they are having challenges with the browser. Because I think the, the vocabulary that we use internally does not necessarily match up with how they talk about um, challenges that they're having. We're also, uh, you know, basically even, uh, it just doesn't align with their expectations or their mental model of how they're going to receive support. So that, that was an interesting finding. Um, finally, like simplified sync and data integration, uh, dashboard view of health, browser health, and clear and trustworthy controls over privacy and security. So in terms of privacy and security, this group was pretty interesting. They're similar to Evergreens in some way, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, in that when you ask them about privacy and security, they often conflate those ideas. Um, so they don't necessarily distinguish, their mental model of privacy and security is not, uh, okay, like privacy is one thing and security is another thing. Let's say, so, so you ask them about, hey, so tell me about, uh, what are your notions about your private information being protected online? And a common response among this group and Evergreens would be, um, well, you know, I'm really worried about someone hacking my computer. So, which to me, uh, from my perspective, is more of a security issue. It's not a, a privacy issue. So we have to find some way of, of appealing to this group's vocabulary differently in order to tease apart those different concepts for them. Um, okay, so the next group uh, is, this was the group that we, discovered uh, existing really more clearly after we did the quantitative research. So this is a group we would call middle managers. This is a group that their I statement is, I'm comfortable and confident with technology, especially troubleshooting it. Technology is an important part of my day-to-day -day life, but I carefully evaluate new technology before I adopt it. Uh, this was a woman who was a middle manager um, that we met in Toronto. Um, so this is, in terms of answering your question earlier, you about uh, the spectrum-y aspect of this, the middle managers is probably the most spectrum-oriented group. I would say that they're somewhere between busy bees and enthusiasts uh, in terms of their behavior and motivations and attitudes toward what they're doing. Um, so this is a group that is comfortable and confident with technology, but they're not enthusiastic about it. So that's how we sort of tease them apart. Like the questions that we asked uh, was like, okay, so this is a group that like understands how the internet works. They use it every day in their job. Uh, they're pretty on top of 
new developments, but they're not really like excited about it. Like it's not their life. Like it's a, sort of like a utility oriented view. Um, but they're not afraid to solve their own technology problems. They're not afraid to explore new things. Uh, they carefully evaluate um, new technology. So they, you know, like an enthusiast, like whenever some new thing comes out, like for example, what's, we could say like Google Glass, for example, just as an example, like I'm sure the enthusiasts are like, oh wow, that's amazing. Like I'm really interested in that. Um, like, I'm kind of curious to see, like, I'm going to read a bunch of articles on The Verge about that. Like, I kind of want to know, like, what's going on with that. You know, maybe when it becomes affordable, I'll get one. Whereas in middle managers, their attitude toward new technology like that is, they probably hear about it later. And then they would hear about it and think, well, I'm going to evaluate this. Like, how is this going to impact my life? Is this going to make my life easier? Is it going to make it more challenging? Um, so this is a group that, you know, they probably have an office job and or are freelancers uh, or are in school uh, as students. And so work, school, life, it's all fully integrated into the technology that they use. Um, they have a more sophisticated mental model of the Internet. Um, and uh, because of that, are a little more patient with solving their own technology problems. So this is a group that um, is um, definitely out solving their own problems in terms of challenges that they might have with, with, with technology and not just the browser. So this is a quote from the, the woman that we interviewed in, in Toronto, which she said, there are more tools on the internet now than ever before to help you solve your own problems. So for her, it was really interesting talking to her. Like she really liked talking. She was really into Firefox. Um, she'd been using it since 2004. Uh, she had all these crazy add-ons. She didn't necessarily know what all of them did specifically. She had like ghostery and stuff. She was like, I, I have ghostery. I don't know what it does exactly, but it's cool. I think, I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm supposed to have it. So I have it. Um, and so, um, and then, but for her, like whenever she had challenges, like she would, she talked to us, she said, like, I had this problem last week. This was how I solved it. So she went online and looked uh, at various sources to solve her own problems. So there's a certain amount, there's a good deal of confidence uh, with this group. Uh, so they, like I said, they adopt the latest tools and features, but do so thoughtfully. Uh, they're likely to have mobile. They're going to have more than one mobile device, and they're likely to have most of their data integrated across uh, their browser, uh, across their various devices. Finally, it's also a group that does a lot of multitasking, um, particularly because they're using the internet um, in a work or school context often. Um, they're often doing multiple things at the same time. So they self-report as being online often. Uh, interestingly, they have less educational attainment, uh, we learned, than enthusiasts or wizards. Uh, they tend to be a little more female, and they also have skew either younger or uh, middle-aged. So that was, that was kind of interesting uh, as, a, as a finding in terms of the demographics. Uh, in terms of what we can do for them, it's not terribly different than the enthusiasts. Um, they, so, um, you know, for this, this group, um, I, you know, I don't really have much more to add on that, so. Um, I just want to move on to the next group, which are, honestly, this is actually my favorite group. Uh, and I am not a stalwart. I probably personally am sort of somewhere between an enthusiast and a wizard. Uh, but I uh, love this group. Uh, I think they're really amazingly interesting. They also tend to be one of our more vocal groups. Uh, so the I statement for stalwarts is, I prefer to stick with technology. I believe works for me, even if it might be outdated. I'm reluctant to upgrade most technology I use because I believe if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so this is an interesting character that we interviewed who was in LA, his name was Alexander. He was using Firefox 3 and he had it crazily tricked out. Um, and it was really interesting because he refused to upgrade to any recent version. He was like, what, you know, it works on my computer. 
I don't know why you guys keep changing things and updating the browser. It's totally like Firefox 3 was the best thing that you ever did. You should have just stopped there. Um, so if you've ever read, and I'm sure you have, uh, mozillazine.org, this is what I call like the like tied concentrated center of stalwarts. I'm going to read a quote from uh, a participant, uh, a poster on um, Mozilla Zine that really summarizes stalwarts. Um, so someone writes, to answer your question about why I use Firefox 7, and this was uh, written in, uh, I think, uh, February of this year. You may have noticed a lot of help requests on this forum from people who use later versions and only one on here from me about Firefox 7. And that one isn't really that big of a deal. That should speak for itself. But just to further illustrate my point, I want to just say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I am not, on, I'm not one to upgrade just because one is available. I don't upgrade unless there's a pretty important reason to do so. I used to, but it got to the point where I spent more time upgrading my computer than using it for what I bought it for. So I decided my computer was stable enough and let it be. Um, so this group is surprisingly a little more large, a little larger than I anticipated, um, but not, not that large. Uh, so this is a group, their primary attribute is their change averse. They avoid upgrading tools unless there's a reason to do so. They prefer the known to the unknown. Uh, they tend to treat activity online uh, as a discrete activity. So most of the people that we interviewed who fell into this category, um, they had like a desktop computer and this was their computer. And when they were online, that was what it was for. Uh, and they did their thing online and then they stopped using it. Uh, and so th this is also a group that tended to not have smartphones uh, because why, why would I want to be on the internet just anywhere? <laughs> um, you know, why I've got, I've got my computer to do that. Why would I do that anyplace else? Um, this is a group that also tends to have older technology, either because of economic constraints or just change your version. Like, Hey, my computer works now. Why would I buy a new one? Um, interestingly, this is a group that had a pretty wide age distribution. They also tended to skew, um, a little bit more male than female, which I actually expected this group to skew really male. Um, but it was interesting to find that they didn't. Uh, and I can say like, I find this group interesting just because um, they are really vocal, like in the Mozilla community, uh, especially like on our UX blog, like half the comments are like, why do you guys change stuff? Like stop, stop adding new features, like just leave it as it is. Um, and then there's obviously Mozilla Zine, and I'm sure you all receive a lot of requests like, why did you move this, you know, or something along those lines. But it's interesting to see that they're not really um, a significant portion of the population, about 13, 14%. That's sort of rounding up. Um, so uh, in terms of what we could do for them, that's a good question. Like, this is not a new feature oriented group. Uh, so for things that we could do for them, like I would say make Firefox fast and optimizable for all versions, uh, optimize Firefox for older machines, uh, especially Windows. So this is a group that are, you know, is not going to have the latest version of any operating system. In fact, it's going to be a pretty XP heavy group. And that's an interesting finding that we discovered throughout all of our qualitative research was that Windows XP is really heavily used all over North America still. People still use it a lot. And it's really important for us to optimize for those older versions of, of Windows. Um, you know, one thing that we can consider uh, is providing control to these users over the update path. Uh, we can encourage contributions from them. Uh, and because, you know, we're not going to appeal to them with adding new features, but they certainly have uh, information to share. They, this is a group that tends to have a lot of knowledge about 
the current state of their browser uh, and is able to provide a lot of information about what works and what doesn't work for them. So we only have two more groups and then uh, having the, I'm gonna try to get through these as quickly as possible so we have time for questions. So this is a, this is a group that I really like also called Evergreens. Uh, their I statement is, I could probably live much of my life without technology. I feel some reluctance about using some technology because I fear I may make mistakes that I cannot correct. Uh, <clears throat> so this was a woman that we interviewed in Toronto. Um, and uh, so I like her quote, actually. I want to read it because I think it's really uh, pretty uh, telling and interesting. So she says, I learned Firefox. And I like that phrasing. I learned Firefox. Uh, and now I'm accustomed to it. I don't want to learn a new program. My husband tried to put Chrome on my computer, but I said, I don't want it. So uh, Evergreens are, their most salient feature uh, or salient attribute is a high discomfort about technology. Uh, this is a group that has difficulty managing technology. They have a low interest in technology. They could probably live their life without it. Interestingly, though, this is not necessarily like an older group specifically. Like it does, if you look at the age range, it does tend to skew older, but there are also younger people who fit into this category as well. They tend to not customize their, their browsing experience. Uh, the internet is not a focal point of their life. Like this is a group that's more interested in face-to-face -face communication. Uh, the internet is a discrete task for them in the same way it is for stalwarts. But probably this group is, would take it further. Um, you know, I would say Evergreens would have the behavior, and we observe this, of when they're not using their computer, they turn it off. Um, so that's, which is different from other groups. Uh, learning software and tools and technology for them is like vocational training. So that's why I found uh, that quote really important, like where she says, I learned Firefox. So it's like, I learned how to drive. I learned how to um, build a table. Like it's this notion of there's not uh, continuity between different kinds of similar applications. So there's not like a continuity between using Internet Explorer and Chrome and Firefox. Uh, to this group, these things are all different things. Uh, and you have it's something you have to learn. Like they don't necessarily see uh, the clear similarity uh, between these programs. Because of that, like they tend to also have a very limited mental model of the internet. Um, it's, you know, and so this is something that I'm personally interested in exploring uh, just because I think it's very useful to understand from a support perspective, but also from a, a user experience perspective what this group's mental models and the metaphors that they use of the internet. Uh, because I think the model, the, the metaphors that they use are these kind of container metaphors, where it's like they have, there's the internet and it's, or there's my computer and inside of it is the internet. But they don't necessarily distinguish that there's all these different layers. They don't distinguish that there's an operating system, there's a browser, there's email. Those things can exist within one another but they aren't, to them, like, so uh, we were interviewing this one woman and she was talking about how she was getting these window warnings when she was using Firefox, but she couldn't tell where they were coming from. Like, she couldn't distinguish, like, is it from the operating system? Is it from the browser? She didn't know the difference between those things. Um, it was really interesting, like, I and, for me, like it, that sort of clicked. Like I never understood how those like banner ads w were possibly successful. The ones that you see that are like your computer might have a browser or might have a virus, but they are aimed like at this sort of limited mental model uh, that this sort of user might have. Uh, and so I'm wondering if there's other metaphors or ways that we can talk about um, the browsing experience and the browser in relationship to other parts of the computer that might help elucidate those differences for people. Um, as I said, this group tends to skew a little older and a little more female, uh, but there's a pretty reasonable distribution in terms of age. So it's not just like oldsters, you know, it's not people who are 
came onto the internet when they were later, you know, and it, it was later in their life. It's also young people. There are certain young people who fall into this category. Uh, this is also a group that has less educational attainment. Um, so in terms of things we can do for them, uh, integrate help and support more fully into the browser uh, and focus help vocabulary around this user group. Uh, have a first run experience where we could walk them through common features. Uh, we can do this with updates as well. Show them how something new is like something that they already know how to do and calm trepidation and nervousness with, with uh, whimsy. So this is actually one of the reasons that we found that for this group that they really liked Firefox was they liked all those sort of, um, they liked the character, uh, they liked the animals. <laughs> actually, everybody liked the animals. It's true. Like everyone, like I think, I think our icon is probably a huge factor in our continued uh, adoption rate in the marketplace. People really love it. And for this group, like, uh, especially. So I'm going to hit finally the last group. Uh, this is a group that I call Wizards. Uh, and this is a group that is, I enjoy writing software for myself and others. Technology is my life. Um, so you work with these people every day. Uh, you might be one of them. So this is a group that we we discovered. Uh, well, we really need to discover this group. I mean, we work. You work with these people all the time. This is your cohort. This is everyone within what I like to call the technology world bubble uh, of the Bay Area or any other technology hub. Uh, but I I felt like I felt it was really important from a product perspective uh, to point out how tiny this group actually is within the larger population. Um, and I'm sure you guys are really aware of that, um, working uh, in your context. Uh, but from an engineering perspective and from a product perspective, I, I wanted to really advocate, like, this is a tiny, tiny percentage of our overall population. Um, the discussions that we have internally um, that are directed toward this group this is not to say this is not an important group. This is a really important group. This is a, certainly an influencer group. Uh, I would say enthusiasts are probably a more important influencer group, but I would say this group is really important uh, in terms of uh, influencing others as well as the overall reputation of our browser. But in terms of appealing to this, this group specifically, they're a tiny, tiny percentage of the overall population. Of Firefox users. So this is a group that's a software developer and engineer. They have a highly accurate mental model of the internet. They're confident about installing, using, and troubleshooting technology. Uh, a quote we heard from one of our participants was, the internet is my job. Uh, they enjoy creating technology. Uh, they have a high level of satisfaction with Firefox. Uh, so this is a group that uh, they're using Firefox for a specific reason. Uh, they're choosing to use Firefox, and they are making a very informed decision about that choice. Um, this is a group that tends to skew mail and also has a higher level of educational attainment. Uh, so in terms of things that we can do for them, uh, I would say beyond enthusiasts, but you know, I think it's important for us to continue to develop interesting development tools uh, and to advertise them. It's funny, like I can't, you know, I come from an engineering background before I started doing user research. Uh, and I can't tell you how many people that I worked with in the past who uh, have all switched to Chrome because it's the new hotness or whatever. Uh, and we're all, we were all using, obviously, I mean, Firefox was really exciting back in like 2005 because it was, it made web development possible. Uh, and, 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 but it's funny, like how many of them don't know about all the amazing, awesome new web developer tools that we have. And so I don't know how we can, you know, I need to, I want to talk more about this with product marketing. I don't know how we can advertise this more, but when I show these features to my, my friends who are still developers, like they're all like, wow, this is awesome. Why didn't I, I'm going to start using Firefox again. And it's also fast, like it's faster than Chrome now. What the hell? So it's pretty funny. Like, so in terms, I feel like for this group, what we can do for them is like 
advertise to them more. Um, but it's funny, also, like, you know, just out of personal interest, like, I tend to keep up with, like, Hacker News and things like that. And it seems like we have had a bit of a turn in the last few months in terms of just my anecdotal impressions of our reputation and what we're building. Like, people seem to have turned on Chrome recently, and we seem to be getting people back. And it's funny, like, mentioning that point in general, like, I would say... The enthusiasts that we um, interviewed, many of them had recently come back to Firefox. Many of them had been using Chrome for a while, but had recently returned to Firefox uh, because they felt like uh, Chrome had become slow and lagging and they thought, well, I've heard that Firefox is faster now, and then they tried it again, and were surprised and happy, and learned, and they learned about all of the add-ons and customization features that we had, and were excited about it. So, uh, so lastly, uh, here's the stall, the, the hybrids. Um, these are the different hybrids that we identified. Um, so, the largest group of hybrids was stalwart enthusiasts, which I find kind of uh, weird. Um, I need to go in and look at those answers and see how people responded to those questions because I'm kind of curious. We did have in the survey, we did have a lot of, uh, we did have some questions that we eliminated responses for based on them being contradictory. So we had a lot of validation checks within the within the, the questionnaire. So I need to go in and actually reevaluate a couple of those questions. Uh, Evergreen Busy Bees obviously makes a lot of sense. Busy Bee Middle Managers, Evergreen Stalwarts, Busy bee stalwarts, wizard stalwarts, those all make sense. But stalwart enthusiasts, I find a little odd. Um, so anyway, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, thanks to everyone who helped gather data for this project. Although I'm presenting all this everywhere, this was very much a group project. Um, so many people were involved in this, um, either in analysis or helping us um, put together the initial set of questions, uh, for going out and participating and observing on uh, the user interviews. Um, and uh, at this point, I'm happy to answer questions. But before I do that, there's one thing I would like to say, which is, um, you know, when we, when we are doing, and Michael um, learned learned about this and was able to, to join us. But in the future, you know, when we are doing um, user interviews or user tests, like we encourage, uh, in fact, we, we sort of insist on people outside of user research coming and observing. Uh, I think it's really essential, um, an essential service that user research provides to uh, the organization at large. Like it's, there's nothing like and uh, you guys have this experience, so I don't have to necessarily advocate this to you. But uh, I just want you to know other groups less so. And so like, it's really exciting just to let them know, hey, um, we want you to come observe. Uh, and because there's an incredible value to it. But um, we just want you to know that there's an, always an open invitation uh, for, for anyone to, to join uh, our, our user research uh, interviews. So, are there any questions? <laughs> Looks like lots. Okay, do you yeah. want to go first? You get to pick. <laughs> okay. Um, one, one question I have is, um, did you give people specific tasks and then watch them accomplish those tasks? I would be uh, specifically yeah. interested in, uh, like, from the support perspective, like, once they, if you did that, um, like when they ran into issues, did you watch them, how they recovered from issues? So this was less of a, um, this was not really, this was less user testing and more uh, qualitative ethnographic research. Okay. So uh, we did not, we asked for the diary study, we asked people to um, share information about what they were currently doing. Uh, and if we, if someone during a qualitative interview reported to us, for example, um, oh, I had this issue recently, then we would ask them as a follow-up, you know, hey, can you show us 
what you were doing and why this was challenging. And this is so, this is how we gathered um, some of the information that I was sharing in terms of like vocabulary and things like that, in terms of support. Um, but in ter overall, like we were more interested in those things, like, like I said earlier, behavior, motivations, attitudes, uh, beliefs. So this was more qualitative and, and um, ethnographic than uh, toward a specific task. We, I mean, user research does do research along those lines, certainly, uh, and, but it's usually towards specific features. So, so Kadir, that was, so for instance, one person that, um, that I was there for that we interviewed in the course of the interview ran into a problem. And then later at the end, we asked as a follow-up. So remember that problem you had, what, you know, let's say we weren't here, you had to solve this, what would you do? And that's where, he, you know, he searched Google, but then was stuck because he clicked on the ads that were served at the top of the search results and, and you know, was ready to call an 800 number and pay $35 to get his question asked kind of thing. But, you know, that was one of the things that we saw. Oh, I see. I remember that. Yeah, that's really interesting. No, I mean, it's funny because I took a couple of people who had never been on um, user interviews before and qualitative interviews. Uh, and people would present problems. And I had to tell people before we went, like, you, you cannot in the midst of the interview, help them. <laughs> we want to know their incorrect interpretation uh, or their incorrect interpretation of uh, what they're doing. Like that's, that's important information for us. Like at the end of the interview, like when it's over and we're giving them their t-shirt, like then we can talk to them about it if they ask us. But um, I want, you know, don't, <laughs> don't tell them, uh, how to solve their problems, which is really hard at first for people to do. So I, I have a question. First of all, I just want to thank you. This is like super great research and it's really uh, enlightening to, to see so some of this info. And I love the icons and the naming and the presentation in general. <laughs> Kudos yeah, I love to whoever did that. We actually are making stickers. We have little cards. Oh, actually, I have them upstairs. We have little cards that we're sending out to everyone that are flashcards that have uh, picture the pictures and all of that on them. And we're also making posters, and we're sending them out to all the offices. Awesome. So that's that's great. My question is related to a more traditional model, the the adoption bell, and how does this correlate to that? If there's any correlation, if we can make uh, connections, if we should discard that adoption bell because we've so, been in the market quite a lot and it doesn't make sense anymore. Do you mean uh, in terms of like like expertise level? Somehow, because the adoption adoption bell is also used for expertise, right? So right. the early adopters are usually uh, the experts, they're the ones that become right. the prospectors and the experts and the laggers are usually the ones who need all the help and I will say that they correlate somehow to the group that we identify as the ones who don't want to update at all. Right. So it's interesting. So um, one of the things that we deliberately tried to avoid when we were doing analysis was to use that kind of model. We really wanted to avoid uh, this notion of expertise uh, when we were putting these groups together. Like we wanted to focus, because there's been a lot of research on that. We wanted to focus more on behaviors and motivations and attitudes and beliefs. And so um, we wanted to avoid like the, 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 the path of putting people in groups according to expertise, because we felt like that pigeonholed people too easily and too quickly. Mm -hmm. It didn't provide the sort of depth and interesting kinds of, uh, I ideas that we could could pull out of this. So one of the things, one of the goals that we wanted to have was deliver these kind of insights that could be used for innovation, uh, to be used for the uh, user experience team and for the product development team. 
And we felt like if we focus on expertise and identifying these groups, that that would cause people to talk about these user groups in a very limited way and sort of prevent uh, us from, you know, appealing to as many different kinds of, of groups as possible. However, that's not to say that there is not a thread underneath this that's sort of unspoken that I'm glad that you picked up on, but I don't really, you know, we didn't want to spend so much time elaborating on, but yes, there's certainly a, there is certainly a level of, of expertise um, that, that runs throughout um, these uh, user types. You know, obviously wizards and enthusiasts are gonna be on the more expert end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Uh, evergreens and busy bees are going to be on the less expert end of the spectrum. Uh, middle managers, hence the name middle, are going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, busy bees also somewhere in the middle. There also be probably enthusiast stalwarts um, tend to also be somewhere in the middle. Like they know enough to what they want, but then uh, have a certain limitation on how far they're willing to go. Um, in terms of um, how, yeah, in terms of how we presented this, though, like we definitely did not want to uh, focus on on that quite as much. Um, so the way I would, the way I tend to talk about it is how the the accuracy or sophistication of the mental model of the internet and the browser that the user has. Like to me, that is from a ethnographic qualitative perspective, like the definition of expertise level. Um, and so that is how we are talking about it in terms of uh, the presentation that we're giving uh, and how we're presenting the findings. But on the other hand, like, yeah, you could certainly read that into these. Okay. So, uh, Bill, my question kind of related to that. So it was, kind of is really to check with you my observation, the kind of things that I saw. So thinking about this uh, in terms of like expertise or, or so in support, we're often talking about things like how detailed of information do we provide for people, right? Do we try to right. simplify? How much do we simplify? How many, you know, do we go into details about troubleshooting? Are we just trying to like, here's the simple way to fix it, but you know, maybe right. you could use a more surgical tool over here, those types of things, right? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so what I saw is certainly there was, there was like, you, you know, you could kind of put some of these groups together, like the busy bees and the evergreens in terms of support, like mm -hmm. just, man, help me get this done quick. I don't care about the details right. as easy exactly. as possible, right? And you had other groups like the enthusiasts or the wizards, who would be like, give me all the details. I can read okay. this. It's no problem. That kind of stuff. And, you know, there's some people sort of in the middle and all, but, but one thing that struck me was, um, even, uh, so at least from our working at Mozilla every day kind of perspective was to like take those levels of expertise and kind of even ratchet them down a level. It like, yeah. So that even the people who were clearly wizards, um, in terms of their specific Firefox knowledge, um, there were lots of things um, that they that they didn't know. Like you know, the guy that we interviewed, I think you sh showed a picture of them. He 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 was a hacker, like for Bank yeah. of America or something. But yeah. um, things like that he didn't use in Firefox or didn't know about were things that you would think like sync or tab groups or app tabs or any of those things were all when we talked afterward those are all re revelations for him oh wow that that's cool but of course it was also like comfortable with about config and um right yeah so strange yeah, mixes of things like that yeah and that's the thing that was the reason that we kind of wanted to avoid because we felt like there was a lot more nuance in terms of how people, um, what people's level of expertise is. And, and, and in a way, like when you use that, we, we sort of felt like it, with the adoption curve, 
that people already have this preconceived notion of what expert is um, or what beginner is. And so we wanted to like learn the nuance of what people were doing as opposed to bringing that. And I'm not saying for this group because you guys work with this, these users often and I've, I've done support, support uh, sumo days and read some of the questions and they do run the gamut. It's like crazy stuff that like, I'm not running, I'm gonna have to install like a virtual machine with Linux and under, to, to like answer this person's question. Like I'm, there's just no like, to like very beginner kinds of questions. But from a product perspective and people who don't deal with this every day, we were concerned that they would impose these sort of unnuanced notions of expertise onto, onto that. So we wanted to avoid that, get into the kind of nuance that, that Michael's talking about. Would you say that this research um, is less about, it, it will tell you less about, or it tells you less about what people know but it tells you a lot about how people will react to the things that you do. Hmm. Like we, we do something on Sumo and this will tell us how uh, the user base will actually react to it. Like how an enthusiast will react to it. Like 30% would react this way and 23% yeah. would react this way. I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a bit of both. Like I think it, we can tell you anecdotally and behaviorally, what people know approximately uh although as michael gave us in that example like you might be surprised at the differences in terms of what people know within a particular group um on the other hand yeah i think it absolutely will give you a general a much better notion of how people will respond to specific um features or specific kinds of information etc like, you know, okay, stalwarts, like, you know, I, we can kind of guess like what they're going to say when we uh, roll out Aurora, for example. Um, or bug them about upgrading on the help site, Yadir. Right, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's something that we are rolling out now, essentially telling people that they should update, but apparently at least 14% of our users, so we thought or assumed that they're just out of date because they're out of date. Something happens, something te technically or whatever. But this is telling us actually that 14% of them will stay on an outdated version no matter what because they want to. But that, and again, though, this is only in North America. Like, I, you know, I want to qualify yeah. that. Okay. I don't know what that would be in, in Europe or in uh, Russia or in. Uh, Indonesia, for example, we're actually going to be doing, um, we're not going to, so we're going to be doing user research this summer and fall in Asia. Uh, we're going to be going to Indonesia, Thailand, and India. Um, we're not going to be replicating this study there because we feel like these are places that we haven't studied in incredible detail. We want to get a more, do a more general uh, ethnographic study of how people use um, the internet and Firefox uh, in those places, but more generally the internet so that we can build uh, features for those specific users in those emerging markets. Um, but we would like to, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, like this, this, this study has been pretty well received and people are really enthusiastic um, in different parts of the organization about it. And so I think we might hopefully get resources to do replicate the study elsewhere. But in, 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 the, in, in the immediate term, we don't, we're not, we're not planning on, on that, but just, um, so, so, so I would, I would qualify like, yeah, this is for North America. Yeah. 14% of your population is going to never upgrade. <laughs> well, this or is really like, uh, rarely. And this is really important to us. I mean, it, it tells us that at some point, pushing harder on the updates is not going to lead to more updates. It's going to actually hating the side. Um, yeah. And change aversion is a, is a universally human trait right. that exists across populations. So you can guess. But the thing is that, that I found really helpful about this was we often have these debates because this, this is a group that tends to be very vocal, like especially on the UX blog. And we can now say like, 
are we going to hold back certain features for such a tiny percentage of the population? You know, do we really need to focus our attention uh, to prevent uh, new feature development on such a small percentage of the, the population? Probably not. So there was one more question. Oh, I was just going to point out to Gadir that, I mean, we also, with the people that I interviewed, we saw busy bees stuck on old versions, though. Mm. Um, and it wasn't that uh, she was um, adverse to upgrading. Just the, the Windows account control dialog scared her. And uh, mm. that, was a, that was a stopper right there. So she was stuck on 401. <laughs> Did you upgrade her? Yeah, we upgraded her afterward. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have to run in a couple of minutes. Are there any final questions? Um, William, uh, I was wondering, we're doing some studies around updates specifically as well with the user advocacy team. Um, would it be possible for us to get like some of the verbatims and um, raw data that you guys had specifically around updates from this uh, study? Um, yeah, I'll look into what we have. So the problem... Uh, we don't have transcripts from the interviews, uh, which is uh, unfortunate. Um, but we had a limited budget, and we were not able to. <laughs> Hopefully, this is all changing so that we are actually like getting budget for these things, because you know transcripts are really important for that reason. I can give you um, some some of the um, some of the uh, quotes that I do have. Um, I'm also happy to provide you with. Um, some of the quantitative questions uh, that we used in our quantitative study for validation that identify uh, people as being update averse. If you wanted to reuse those questions. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And so, otherwise, I'm gonna I'm happy to share out the full version of this presentation with everyone. I will. Uh, it's really large, so it's going to be a Dropbox link. Uh, I apologize for that in advance. Um, but otherwise, I will share that out today for everyone. Uh, I sent you, uh, yeah, so Bill, thanks a lot for doing this. This was super yeah, helpful. Pleasure. I sent you an email with the Etherpad. If you could put the link on there, that would be extremely helpful. Yeah. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, uh, please let me know. I'm on the UR channel and the UX channel all the time. Uh, w Selman, you can email me. Uh, let me let me know how I can help. Thanks a lot for taking the time. All right, thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a good day. Bye, Bye everyone.